Pastor, uh, uh, to talk about that as well. Following this, uh, this hour and a half or so of this production processing talk, we're going to have a Q&A with everybody up here, and that's where we really encourage you to have those questions ready. Uh, we're going to set up a table um, and allow you all to ask any questions that you have. Um, so again, uh, I would like to introduce Brian Parr, le uh, agronomist from Legacy Hemp. Uh, take it away, Brian. Thanks, Phil. Uh, so, as Phil mentioned, I work as the agronomist for Legacy Hemp, and uh, what our company does, uh, we deal primarily with the grain and the fiber. Uh, we do not do much of the CBD. So, and I'll kind of explain the differences here as we go at the beginning of uh, what that is. Oops. Sorry. Uh, so, the first thing I want to just mention is that this plant is a uh, dicotyledonous plant. And what that means is that it has two cotyledon leaves when it comes out of the soil. Uh, you can think of this very similarly to soybeans. Uh, soybeans is also a dicotyledonous plant. Uh, it is primarily dioecious. And what that means is that this plant has, has separate male and female plants, typically. Uh, we do sometimes see that this plant can become monaceous, uh, and in some, some places uh, in the cannabis world, this is termed as hermaphrodites, uh, where we get uh, one a plant that has both male and female reproductive organs on the same plant. Typically, they are on separate plants. Uh, reproduction occurs through uh, pollination, and that pollination will typically last one to three weeks. It's a fairly long, uh, drawn-out process. Um, this plant provides a lot of pollen, and once the male plants shed their pollen and release it in the females who will bear the seed, uh, those males will completely 100% die. They will be gone by the time harvest is, is uh, happening. Um, this plant itself is considered a photoperiod dependent crop. It's a short day crop, meaning that uh, it will not start flowering until the days start getting shorter, meaning uh, it will not flower prior to June 21st. Uh, so, it, and really it actually pertains to the amount of darkness. Uh, we need at least uh, that nine or 10 hours of complete darkness to initiate flowering. Uh, plant height is determined by several factors, including the environment, but uh, probably more so the type of hemp, whether you're growing for grain, for fiber, or for CBD. That plays a large uh, role as to the height of these plants. Uh, the roots can reach depths of one to two feet. Uh, we can get uh, instances where this will be shallower in wet conditions, in drier conditions, uh, we may see three feet of, uh, of root growth. The, the one thing about this plant is that it is very fast growing. Uh, once it hits its rapid growth stage, we're seeing uh, anywhere between one and three inches of growth per day, uh, depending on the environment and, and uh, variety. So there are three primary types of hemp. We have our Cannabidiol, our CBD, which uh, for those of you that don't know that cannabidiol is one of about a hundred different cannabinoids. Uh, so CBD is a cannabinoid, THC is a cannabinoid. The same with CBC, CBG, there's about a hundred of them out there. Uh, CBD tends to be the popular one right now for the market. Uh, we also have fiber and we also have grain. And just as a show of hands, how many people are here interested in uh, CBD production? Okay, fair amount. Uh, how about the fiber? All right, uh, grain? Okay, sure. So I'm gonna touch on all three of these just briefly. Uh, this talk is primarily about grain production and, and the agronomics on how to produce a grain crop. Uh, but I will touch on, on all three of them just briefly here. So CBD hemp, uh, this is more similar to growing vegetables, produce, or 
tobacco. Uh, for those of you that remember or used to grow tobacco, uh, this is very, very similar to raising tobacco. Uh, as you can see with our pictures here, they're planting this uh, very large uh, spaces uh, between the plants. Uh, typically, uh, we're laying down plastic to keep control of the weeds in row, just like we do vegetable production. Uh, our planting stock is typically by seed or by transplant, uh, which uh, can be either seedlings that we start from seed uh, or clones where we actually uh, can replicate uh, this plant 100% by its leaf or, or uh, branches. Uh, in this type of production system, we are only interested in female plants. The female plants of this hemp are what contain the majority of the oil that has the CBD we're after. Uh, males in this situation can virtually ruin an entire crop. Uh, so one thing we look for in CBD production is we're looking for feminized seeds, or clones. Uh, clones will be an identical genetic replica of its mother. Um, and the reason that uh, the males are, are not uh, favorable is because they shed their pollen and the females, rather than producing more oil, will start producing seed. Uh, when they start producing seed, uh, it drastically lowers uh, your, your oil content, which is what contains the CBD. Uh, planting method is typically done by hand uh, or by a transplanter. Um, this is the type of hemp we can grow in a greenhouse. Uh, so so if, if anybody is looking to do greenhouse production, this will likely be uh, the type of hemp that you're, you're after. Planting rates will range anywhere between 1,000 and 2,000 plants per acre. Um, you can see how far apart they are spaced here. Um, when we think about a one pound of, of hemp seed, uh, one pound of hemp seed contains roughly 25,000 seeds per pound. Uh, we're planting for CBD at about one-tenth of one pound per acre. Uh, so we describe this more on a per plant basis versus a per pound basis. Uh, again, harvest is, is typically done by a uh, hand. Uh, there is beginning to be some mechanization uh, to this, but generally what will happen is farmers will literally go out and hand cut each one of these plants on a per acre basis. Uh, and then once they are cut off the field, it is very important to get them to a place to start drying. Um, there's, there's essentially a couple different methods to drying this. We can, we can dry and hang the whole plants in a, a drying warehouse or a drying shed like our old tobacco sheds or we can debranch them uh, prior to, to uh, storing or drying because that will save some space in, in your areas wherever you're going to be doing that. So one of the misconceptions out there that I often uh, get questions about is, is where the CBD oil comes from. And essentially this plant has two different types of oil. We have oil that can come from the seed, which is termed hemp seed oil, uh, that contains zero CBD. There is no CBD that comes from the oil from the seeds. The oil comes from the female flowers and leaf material. It's the plant material. This is a very resinous plant. It produces oil glands on its leaf surfaces. This picture up in the right-hand corner is a picture of the female flower. Uh, where you have these white hair looking things would be the pistils or stigmas uh, what, of, uh, actually protruding out of the ovule. Uh, the green material is your leaf material essentially and you can kind of see what looks like crystals uh, on that leaf material. Those are what we term the trichomes. That is the oil glands that we're talking about. Those trichomes contain the oil uh, for, that, that have the CBD in them. That's what we're after. Uh, the other thing that uh, we have misconception on is that this plant can be squeezed, squeezing the uh, uh, plant material to get this oil out. That's also not correct. Uh, we have to literally extract this oil out of the leaf material. And the picture on the bottom here is one of the machines that does this. It's a, called a supercritical CO2 extractor. It literally put, you put your material in one of those chambers at, uh, and at such high pressures, uh, it will 
extract the oil out of the plant. This is how that process happens. Uh, as for the fiber type, uh, this is more similar to growing forages or hay. Uh, our planting stock that we're starting with is going to be with, from seed, and our planting method is going to be a grain drill or a broadcast seeder. Uh, we could also use a brilliant seeder as well. Planting rates are going to be between 50 and 70 pounds per acre. We want a lot of plants out there. We're going to have more than a million plants per acre out there. Uh, we, this planting rate is actually double what it is for a grain crop. And the reason we do that is because most often when we're growing for fiber, we're after the bast fibers. And there's two types of fibers. There's bast fiber as well as the herd. The bast fibers are the outside layers of the stalk material. You could think of it as what you see as green um, for easy purposes. As, and then your herd is the inside woody core uh, more, more lignin is contained in that portion of the, the stock. Um, they want very thick, dense uh, stands because when we, when we plant dense, we have a smaller stem diameter. And what that does is it reduces the, the size uh, of the inside woody core to now a small pencil-like, pinky-like uh, stalk. Uh, so now we have very little herd and we still have a lot of that bass fiber because we have more plants out there that have just simply the outside layers. Typically, we're going to mow this with uh, a disc mower, a sickle mower. Um, you can see up in the upper corner there, uh, they're laying this out to field dry, just like we do with hay. Um, the difference being is that, uh, they, for one, they call this field redding, uh, and it's a lot longer process, process than what we deal, deal with with hay. Um, generally, this will take 7 to 21, even up to 30 days, laying out in the field to dry. Um, it, this redding process will actually help with the microbial uh, bacteria and some fungi uh, to break down the, the stock material, uh, to loosen those fibers, to make it easier for processing. Once the, the crop is dry, uh, we're going out and baling the product up with uh, a round baler or a large square baler. Preferably large square bales, they're easier to uh, transport uh, and they're easier for the processors to handle. Uh, so the third type of uh, hemp, which the remaining portion of this uh, talk is going to be about, is the grain hemp. Uh, this is more similar to growing wheat uh, or other small grains. Uh, our planting stock again is by seed, and we are going to use a grain drill, uh, a broadcast seeder, a brilliant uh, seeder, or we could also use a corn planter. Um, for those that do want to use a corn planter, we will need the sorghum plates uh, for your planter to, to actually plant this crop. Uh, again, we're, we're half the rate of a fiber crop because we want larger stalks to be able to hold up the grain heads which will be produced on the top of the plant. Uh, so that planting rate is typically between 25 and 35 pounds per acre. And that will depend on the type of fertility, uh, weed, weed pressure that you have on your own farms uh, that will determine that. Uh, the grain will be combined at harvest time. So you see up in the upper corner there, uh, we have a guy rolling through with a combine. Uh, that is pretty typical for what that harvest will look like. There's a, quite a bit of green material in that uh, plant at harvest time, and, and I'll talk about that here a little later. Uh, but once that grain is harvested uh, and you have a full tank of grain in the, the combine, uh, we have about four to six hours before that starts to spoil. Uh, so it needs to get uh, preferably cleaned right after harvest, and it needs to be put into a grain bin immediately after that uh, before it does start to spoil. So some of the soil uh, types and, and uh, soil recommendations. Um, we are looking for well-drained soils. Our sandy to loamy soils uh, are best suited for this crop. Uh, our clay loams can be uh, a good option if they are well-drained. Heavy clay soils tend to be more of an issue than a benefit. And the reason being is that they hold moisture longer. Uh, and this crop is a crop that does not like saturated or wet conditions. So uh, we tend to try to avoid heavy clay soils that tend to hold water and be, become saturated. Uh, 
Soil temperature, we want to target 50 degrees soil temperature. Uh, this is likely going to be roughly mid-May or so planting time. Uh, the reason we want to target 50 degrees is because we have no herbicide for this crop. There are none out there. Um, there are, are two, possibly three herbicides up in Canada that have been approved, uh, which they have been growing this crop for the last 20 years. Um, the reason there aren't many herbicides is because there's really not much of a use for them. This crop is pretty competitive with weeds, and we find that it's not as necessary uh, to use a herbicide because of its competitiveness. Uh, air temperature, it likes uh, the moderate temperatures, the 65 to 75 degrees, but it, it's going to grow uh, at really any temperature above that as well. Uh, now this crop is a drought tolerant crop, but it is something that we do need a minimum amount of moisture. Uh, we need in that 10 to 15 uh, inches of moisture uh, in a growing season. So this area should not have much of a problem with that. When we start looking in places like Western North Dakota and Eastern Montana, uh, they're lucky to hit 15 inches sometimes. So, so this is uh, something to just, you guys probably are not gonna be having an issue with this, but just to be aware of. Again, with the photo period uh, needing more than 10, 10 hours of darkness. I'll touch on this uh, with the excess moisture. Excess moisture is bad, really bad for this crop. It does not like tremendous rain. And especially when we see it in the, uh, the first several days of planting. Um, what we see is we get an increase in plant mortality. Uh, hemp has a natural high tendency to have a high seedling mortality already. And when we plant this into wet conditions, um, that increases pretty significantly. Um, what also happens is because hemp does not like wet weather, when it's rainy and really wet, uh, it just wants to sit there until the soil dries out. Whereas some of your grassy weeds like foxtail or barnyard grass or maybe uh, yellow nut sage, uh, they like wet conditions and they are going to grow while your hemp just sits there and waits for the soil to dry out. This is why we need to be planting this on well-drained soils so that your soils do drain out and hemp can, and can continue its uh, uh, growth. Ultimately, that can lead to very significant yield loss uh, if we have really wet conditions. Uh, so this slide, I would say, is probably one of the most important ones of, of my presentation here. This is where we're going to identify which fields are best suited for production. And I've highlighted uh, up here, it may be hard to see back there, but our two most important factors in determining which field we plant on is A, we need to look at our most productive fields on the farm. That's where we need to start with. There's a misconception that hemp uh, is going to produce bountiful yields off very low, poor soils. Uh, while it is a remediator, and can reclaim soils, you are not going to make any money doing that. We need to put this on our best soils just like we do all our other cash crops. If we want a cash crop uh, and make some money doing it, it needs to go on our best soils. Um, and of those best soils, we need to put this on the ones that have the least amount of weed pressure. Uh, because we don't have a herbicide that we can use to uh, uh, basically fix an issue, we have to have the situation present that doesn't allow that issue to occur. The other thing that we want to look at uh, are fields that ha are well-drained, like I mentioned, uh, and without compaction. And, and Steve may have some pictures of this later about compaction. Um, this is a plant that will show you where you have problems in the field, whether it's too wet of an area, compacted areas, uh, poor fertility, it's going to show you where you have issues and things to, to work on. Um, fields with white mold. Uh, we want to avoid any fields that have a history of white mold. Uh, this crop is susceptible to sclerotinia. Uh, so keep that in mind uh, for those of you that are looking to rotate after soybeans and have had an issue with white mold, uh, that can be a problem. Rotating after corn, uh, this, this crop does have a fairly high nitrogen requirement. Uh, so rotating after corn, you're likely going to increase your nitrogen demand because of uh, the, the microbes breaking down your corn stalks uh, from the previous year. 
When we look at organic production, uh, all of these same things apply, uh, but I would add to it that it is going to be very, very important uh, that we look at the situation that keeps the weeds from coming. Um, and where we naturally get good weed control is following an alfalfa sod plow down. Uh, no matter which crop we follow, alfalfa, that is usually our best spot in organic production that does not allow the weeds. And because uh, this crop is a, a high nitrogen consumer, uh, that alfalfa is going to provide a good amount of nitrogen uh, by plowing it down. When we rotate after corner soybeans, especially on the organic side of things, uh, we are increasing the potential uh, for high, uh, high volume of weeds as well as a disease uh, potential. Uh, just simply for the fact that those weeds are going to come, uh, it would be similar for those of you that are, are inorganic, if you were to go out and plant your soybeans with a grain drill and never go out and cultivate it. Um, so we've got to think of it in that sense is that the only place we'd ever do that or consider that would be following alfalfa with our soybeans. Um, we may be able to find some uses with a rotary hoe, possibly a tine weeder, uh, or even a harrow. Um, there has not been a lot of experimentation done with this, so I caution uh, even saying this, but there may be opportunities for us to control some weed, weed have some weed control with uh, a mechanical means, being that we do not have a herbicide to be able to use. The other thing we could look at uh, just simply is we increase planting rates and uh, try to use more of a smother effect uh, with this crop to control the weeds. Fertility. Um, <clears throat> like a lot of other plants, uh, the fertility with this plant will increase with age. Uh, its rapid growth stage will start to consume a, a very large portion of nitrogen, uh, and then once we start into flowering, uh, we're also uh, at those peak levels of nutrient demand. Uh, pH, I would say really that could be uh, 6.0 to 7.5. It's got pretty wide range. Uh, for those of you that are, are maintaining alfalfa in your rotation, uh, I, I assume that your pH is right in line with this, so you should not have any issues. As far as nitrogen, we're looking at 100 to 120 pounds of N. Um, I have farmers that have, have gone up to almost 200 pounds per acre of nitrogen and have still seen good response. Um, the only thing that we've got to be careful of with excess nitrogen is similar to green snap and corn, uh, this crop will grow very quickly with a lot of nitrogen and it has a very succulent uh, stem to it until it starts flowering. So if we have heavy winds and we're growing it too fast, uh, we have the potential to have a uh, quote unquote green snap in hemp as well where we can get some lodging. I have not seen that happen yet, but it is a possibility. It is out in the literature that, that they talk about this in Canada. Phosphorus, we're, we're going to be somewhere in that 40 to 70 pounds per acre. Um, potassium, 60 to 100 pounds per acre with sulfur at 15 to 25 pounds per acre. I'll note this, that there is some studies out of Canada that have looked at the uh, nutrient retention uh, of hemp. And basically what they, they have found is that roughly 40% of the nitrogen and roughly 70 to 80% of the potassium is actually leached back out of the plant and back into the soil. So when we're fertilizing this with nitrogen and, and especially potassium, uh, there is a good chance that we will re retain a lot of that back into the soil. So just keep that in mind. Uh, planting. Uh, we want a firm, shallow seed bed. Uh, w rolling and packing your soil uh, may be a good practice. Uh, we want a firm seed bed. Um, planting depth is going to be between a quarter and three quarters of an inch. Uh, this is pretty similar to planting uh, like alfalfa or clover. Think of it that way. Uh, our target depth is a half an inch. Uh, for those on sandy soils and dry conditions, we may be able to see an inch depth uh, without any issue, but we saw a tremendous amount of problem getting our seeding depth right uh, this last season in Wisconsin. Uh, we had a problem where uh, older grain drills that had uh, zero capability of controlling seeding depth were used, and in that scenario, uh, we were planting anywhere between an inch and a half and three inches deep. Um, so I could tell you it's, it's going to be a problem if we are unable to control the seeding depth. Planting rates, uh, we went over that uh, for the grain. Um, 
So planting dates, like I mentioned, 50 degrees soil temperatures so we can get good emergence, get good germination, good emergence to compete with those weeds. Everybody who planted this crop last year had emergence between three and five days. Uh, so when we get emergence like that, we are able to compete with the weeds. Uh, and and it, it, it's really just not that necessary for a herbicide if we place this crop in the correct uh, field locations. Uh, the biggest thing I can stress, and we had an issue with this last year because we had so much rain, but I will tell you this, that this was the hardest thing that a lot of farmers had to overcome, is that we should be planting this crop after a rain rather than before. A lot of our other crops, we're trying to beat the rain, get it in before the rain comes. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, this crop does not like excess moisture. And if we seed this down and we have some heavy rains, which we tend to seem to be getting more often, uh, we're going to have some issues, whether that's crusting of the soil or simply uh, the seed is getting delayed in emergence and now we brought along our whole host of weeds along with it. Um, we had almost uh, two thirds of our farmers last year who planted this crop and the day of planting or sometime in between there in emergence had received anywhere between two and five inches of rain from the day of planting to emergence. And, and in that scenario, uh, we came out with some real serious problems, uh, both in weed, weed control and uh, seedling mortality. Uh, so some of the growth stages here, I'll just kind of go through this a little quickly. Uh, germination generally happens within the first uh, two days, uh, 24 to 48 hours. If you've got good soil temperature, good, good moisture in the soil, uh, it's very possible that by the very next day you, you already see the seed sprouted. Uh, emergence typically is in that four to, ta four to ten day window. Um, and what we consider the slow growth phase, which would be similar to the picture up on the top right there, um, that's going to happen basically for the first 30 days. And that is the point where we have to keep control of these weeds. The first 30 days is the absolute most important. Uh, we're going to see somewhere between 8 and 10 inches of growth in those first 30 days. When we hit the rapid growth stage, which happens usually around day 30 to 45, depending on variety, we start seeing a field more similar to the one on the bottom there. And in the next 30 days, uh, we can see anywhere between two and five feet of growth. So if we can keep the weeds out of there in the first 30 days, the next 30, there, there are no weeds that are going to compete with this crop. Uh, the reproductive phase, as I mentioned, does not occur until the days start getting shorter. Um, generally speaking, uh, we're going to start seeing that happen day 60 to 90, depending on planting date. Uh, maturity is roughly in that 100 to 110 days after planting. Uh, and this is, this is important to note that this is not similar to your relative maturity on corn. Corn requires a certain growing degree units uh, to, to, its, uh, to maximize its, its growth and, and maturity. This plant you could literally just about put on a calendar uh, 100 days out from planting and, and that's roughly when you're going to be planting or, or harvesting rather. Uh, and that time frame is going to be roughly the end of September, beginning of October as a grain crop. Uh, and I'll talk about the moisture here, but we're going to be harvesting this crop roughly uh, 12 to 18% moisture. And I'll explain why a little bit later. Um, so here are some of the pests that we see common to uh, hemp. Uh, this, this is probably uh, a little more so on the grain side than the fiber. Uh, weeds tend to be choked out with the fiber crop because we're planting twice as thick. Um, as you can see in the picture here, uh, this, this crop has been planted and we have a, a tremendous amount of weed growth coming along with it. Um, I can tell you that that is not a good scenario. We do not want that to happen. Um, in this case, uh, we see plants that are uneven with our hemp. We have some elongation happening uh, on the far right there of a couple of those plants and then in the middle there. Uh, some of them are still in that slow growth phase. Uh, the weeds are catching up, basically. Um, we've got to think of ways that we can reduce the weed pressure naturally because we do not have a herbicide and we may not be able to mechanically control the weeds when they come. So planting after a sod crop is, is your best bet to, uh, of insurance to allow you to have the minimal weed pressure that you're likely going to see. Uh, good fertility helps that. Uh, even the use of gypsum or lime. 
there's a lot of anecdotes, uh, anecdotal data that would say that um, gypsum can help uh, reduce your weed pressure by uh, allowing better infiltration of the, the um, moisture and allow the weeds to not germinate as quickly. Uh, the same with lime. If uh, lime contains a lot of calcium, calcium is a part of that reason why we hear a lot of these anecdotes that gypsum and lime tend to reduce weed pressure. Um, if that may help, uh, it may be a good idea to start looking at that as an option. Uh, using compost instead of raw manure. We know that raw manure is going to be a source of weed seeds that typically come. There's a lot of raw nutrients that are there as well. Compost uh, kind of alleviate that problem. They, don't, they typically have very few weed seeds that are going to come, if at all, uh, and the nutrients are in the form that are, are readily available to be uptaken by the plant. Uh, again, our, our most critical time frame here is the first 30 days of, of plant growth to, for weed control. Uh, disease. This is going to be a problem. Uh, this, this crop is susceptible to two primary diseases. Uh, we have white mold, uh, sclerotinia sclerotiorum, and gray mold, botrytis cinerea. Uh, this last season in 2018, we saw a tremendous amount of white mold, uh, especially in Wisconsin. Uh, and, and if we remember back to how the weather was in Wisconsin, we were extremely wet, we were extremely humid, uh, and in our area uh, of the state, which would have been the southwestern area of the state, um, we had a tremendous number of days where we were foggy at night and still throughout the day. I mean, that is just pure moisture uh, that's sitting there for 24 hours, basically, uh, that may have never even burned off during the day. Those conditions bring on disease rather quickly, and we saw a lot of that last season. There's ways that we can reduce that uh, by avoiding fields that are prone to white mold. Uh, we can consider rotating after corn or preferably alfalfa rather than soybeans. Uh, we can also reduce uh, plant populations uh, to allow better airflow through the canopy uh, that will, will help dry things out underneath the canopy rather than having a thick, dense stand that doesn't allow airflow. Deep tillage is a way to bury some of the sclerotia bodies that uh, are the cause of white mold. However, uh, just be cautious that deep tillage can also bring up old sclerotia bodies. They tend to live in the soil between seven and 10 years. So just keep that in mind. Insects, uh, we, we did not have much problem with insects uh, uh, this last season. Uh, in Western Wisconsin, we saw a lot of uh, seed corn maggot. Uh, this is typically not a problem in Wisconsin. Uh, however, because we had a late spring, our last snowfall, we received almost two feet of snow on the last week of April. Uh, so we missed almost all of April to warm our soils and, and have these pest cycles begin uh, in April rather than in May. Uh, so I think the, just the delay in spring is what caused that problem. I don't expect that to be a continued problem in hemp. Um, if we're growing this in a greenhouse, we may experience some, some different problems with pests. Uh, we may have insects that are going to be a problem, such as spider mites, aphids, and white flies. Uh, they can be more of a problem in an indoor environment than outdoor. Uh, the, I, I put European corn borer up here. Uh, we didn't, I did not see any of this last season. Uh, however, it is noted that, that uh, corn borer is uh, or can be a problem in industrial hemp. Uh, I did not see any out there, and we know that we're in corn country here, so uh, corn borer is a common problem around this area. So just be aware of that. We did see quite a bit of Japanese beetles. Um, for whatever reason, they really, really like the pollen from the male plants. Uh, this is a male inflorescence here that you can see those beetles on. Um, when we're planting a grain crop or a fiber crop, as I mentioned before, this is a dioecious plant. Roughly 50% of the seed that gets planted will be male. Uh, so there is a tremendous number of male plants out in any one acre, uh, so we did not see any problems with the Japanese beetle. In fact, this could be a, somewhat of a strategy uh, of uh, basically 
attracting these beetles away from your soybeans, at least during the time of pollination uh, with industrial hemp. So we could use this almost as a catch crop, if you will. Um, I don't know if that would really work, but I could tell you that these beetles really like the pollen. So assessing maturity, uh, the picture here with this grain head, uh, this is a mature head. This is ready for harvest. Um, you can see in the, in the picture with my hand with the seeds there, we have uh, several green seeds uh, which are immature. Uh, this is roughly the time frame that we're going to start harvesting. We are going to have immature seeds at harvest. And the reason we want to do this is because the later we, we take this to maturity and dry this crop down, um, we start to see that the seeds tend to want to shatter off the plant easier. They shell out fairly easy. Um, now, this variety in particular has a pretty dense cone-shaped uh, uh, seed head, which doesn't allow as much shattering. Uh, but there are other varieties that are much more open, uh, and just simply a, a, a strong wind can start blowing seeds out of the grain head. Uh, so we need to start harvesting before, all, before we lose all of our seeds, essentially. Uh, the other reason is, and I'll talk to this uh, uh, in a minute, but uh, we can reduce fiber wrapping in the combine if we increase the, the moisture at harvest. And, and like I said, I'll touch on that here in a minute. Um, grain harvest is 12 to 18 percent moisture. Our dry moisture that we consider dry is 9 percent. And we can achieve this just with forced air in a grain bin uh, rather than running it through a grain dryer. In fact, we do not want to run the seeds or grain through a dryer uh, because at 120 degrees or more, we start to oxidize the oil. Just like we don't like running soybeans through a grain dryer, for those same reasons, we don't want to do that with hemp. <clears throat> so the pre-harvest uh, equipment checklist, uh, just be sure to clean equipment prior to harvest, especially if your previous crop was wheat. Um, most hemp seed is being sold as gluten-free, and if we find hemp in, in this uh, uh, samples or in the load, it's possible that the processor may reject this product. Uh, so make sure you're cleaning out your combines, especially if you were har pri previously harvesting wheat. Um, just maintain your shields. Uh, this is a fibrous crop in its nature. It wants to wrap around every shaft and bearing, anything that's moving, and, and you'll see that it probably will. Um, for that reason, we need to regularly be checking shafts and bearings throughout the combine, on your grain head, throughout the combine. And I think Steve will probably mention this. Uh, I, I believe he had some experience with this that he, he'll probably touch on. Um, we recommend disabling your straw choppers. Uh, you're not doing yourself any favor by chopping all this fiber up and potentially getting more strands that are likely going to wrap and, uh, around your beaters and, or your chopper. So just disabling it is a much better idea than trying to work through it. Uh, it's, it, it you're going to find that it's going to be a lot easier to harvest with new sh uh, sharp knives and guards. Uh, it just wants to cleanly p cut that plant a lot easier than fraying a lot of these fibers, which those frayed fibers are the ones that tend to want to wrap around moving parts. Uh, keep the engine compartment free of dust. This is a, a oily dust. We saw earlier that the leaf material and the flower material contains the oil with the CBD. Uh, that's all blowing around in the air. Uh, that oily dust can collect on your engine and can potentially be a problem uh, if if it it's too hot and is actually able to combust. Uh, word of advice, and I, and I rode around the combine with several different growers last year, make sure you've got a couple sharp knives to be cutting the fiber out of your shafts and bearings because uh, it's going to happen. Uh, and as long as you're maintaining, checking those uh, shafts and bearings regularly, uh, we can avoid much of a problem. So harvest, uh, what we're going to do is we're, we recommend uh, straight cutting, which would be the, the upper photo here, uh, where we're just simply clipping the grain heads themselves. We want to bring as little of the fiber in the combine as possible. Uh, so clipping those heads only will allow for somewhere in that 8 to 10 inches, maybe 12 inches of, of fiber strands to go through. It's a lot harder for 10 or 12 inches to wrap around a shaft than 3 or 4 feet. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, draper headers do work uh, best. Uh, they have more of an even flow than your auger heads. 
both will work, but uh, we, we increase the potential for wrapping if we have slugs going through the combine and uh, drapers are just more constant uniform uh, flow through the, the machine. Uh, when we see uneven stands, and this was something we saw last year because of the wet weather early, uh, we had taller plants that stood maybe five feet tall and we had other plants that maybe stood four feet tall. Um, it may be best to simply leave your uneven stands or the shorter plants because when you drop that header uh, to collect everything, you've now increased the amount of fiber coming from your taller plants. And like I mentioned, if, if you're bringing more fiber in, you increase the potential that that fiber is going to wrap around shafts and bearings. Um, we don't recommend swathing. Uh, you can see in the bottom corner here how much material is going to get ran through that combine. There is a tremendous wind row right there. Uh, we did have a couple guys uh, swath their, their hemp last season. Uh, what they did was they cut it with a swather uh, on one day, and the very next day they went out to combine. Uh, and in both cases, they, they were able to get through it perfectly fine, no issues. In fact, they, they would argue that it's probably better to do it that way. Um, I'm a little bit on the other side is that we have one extra pass to save ourselves uh, one day uh, of, of doing this. So rather than two passes, I would just say it's going to be easier to run your combine with a, a up off the ground cutting just the grain heads. Uh, I'm not going to touch on this because uh, I want to leave enough time for Steve, but just, just note that our combine settings are going to be most similar to canola or wheat. Uh, this is a really easy crop to thresh out of the head, so we do not need high-speed uh, rotors, uh, and we do not need the concaves to be tight. Uh, the, in fact, we want to avoid cracking of the seed, uh, so the more gently we can harvest, the better. So post-harvest. Um, most of this crop, in fact all of this crop, is intended for the food-grade market. We need to take extra care uh, with the seed as not to break it or, or uh, damage it in any way. Uh, that's going to uh, increase the dockage that you see at the processor, just like you see with wheat or oats or barley. Uh, crack kernels are going to be a, a source of dockage. Um, that means that we would prefer to see it be ran through conveyors rather than augers, but uh, obviously uh, augers are, are kind of the norm. Uh, so if we use augers, we run them full, we run them slow, uh, it reduces the amount of cracking and damage to the, to the kernels themselves. Uh, in this photo, uh, what we're doing is we're quick cleaning the grain before it goes into the grain bin. Uh, as you saw at the picture where we're at the uh, harvest time, we're going to have a lot of green material uh, in the stock material itself. So. When we're combining, we're likely going to get some of this green leaves, green uh, chaff stock material in the grain tank because it's harder to blow out of the, with the combine. We should be considering cleaning that before it goes into the grain bin because if we leave it in there, we now have restrictions of airflow and it's not going to dry properly with uh, being unable to get through the leaf and stock material. So in this case, um, because we're harvesting at that 12 to 18 percent moisture, as an oil seed, it wants to spoil quickly. So we have about four to six hours. Um, from most of the farmers who are doing larger acreages, most of what those guys are doing is they're only able to fill half a semi before it's time that they have to get it into the bin. Uh, and that's what's in this case. The front hopper of that grain truck is the only hopper that's full. They're unloading it, cleaning it, and then it's going into the bin to get onto air. Uh, that is the preferred method uh, for, for drying this crop uh, adequately in that four to six hour window. All I can say is do not let this crop sit overnight without being on some type of forced air. Uh, we had a couple farmers that put it in gravity boxes, did not put on air, and by the morning it was, it was too hot to the touch to even uh, handle it. So uh, I can tell you it spoiled uh, by the next day for those farmers. Um, just, you know, if, if for larger farmers, what we find happening, especially up in Canada, is that um, there's a lot of rotating in the bins with this grain, meaning that when that grain bin is full, usually about day three or four after filling it, they're literally emptying the entire grain bin out, putting it into a semi, and putting it right back into that bin just to rotate it to make sure that we don't have any hot spots. 
Um, now, lower, lower volumes uh, are not likely going to cause this problem, but when we start producing that uh, two to 300 acres or more, depending on the size of your bin, uh, this is where we're going to have to start thinking about rotating or turning the bin to keep it from spoiling. Uh, just quickly here, these are two studies out of the University of Minnesota on the, the lower uh, photo uh, or graph, and then the upper graph is out of NDSU. Uh, the upper one is a two-year average from 2017 and 2018. Uh, the variety that we use is X59. Uh, up in North Dakota, we're at 1,500 pounds per acre. Uh, in the University of Minnesota study, uh, we were at 1,400 pounds per acre uh, in 2017. I've been telling farmers to, to figure on average 12 to 1400 pounds per acre conventionally uh, and 800 pounds per acre, uh, 6 to 800 pounds per acre on organic. This is a slide of our actual yield last year uh, in Wisconsin. The, the red color line there is actually our conventional farm with all the others being organic. The purple, uh, we have Viking purple. Uh, this, was, this guy was in Minnesota. Uh, he was at 1800 or 800 pounds per acre, and in Wisconsin we were at uh, basically 450 to 500 pounds per acre uh, and less. Uh, and as I mentioned, wet weather uh, can cause some serious yield uh, declines, and I'll, I'll show this here just real quick. These two graphs indicate the amount of moisture that all of our farms received. Uh, and and the, the one that kind of sticks out here is the guy from Minnesota. So kind of watch the purple guy here. In the first 30 days, um, our farmer in Minnesota was on the top one-third of receiving moisture on those first 30 days. Uh, and in, in some cases, we had upwards of uh, above seven inches of moisture in the first 30 days. However, he ended up drying out through the rest of the entire season. In fact, he was almost one of the driest by the time harvest came. Uh, with our highest uh, moistures uh, reaching over 30 inches, starting from June 1st to the end of September. Uh, that's a heck of a lot of moisture for a crop that does not like wet weather. So when, you, when we plot our yield data against our uh, rain data, we see a trend, and that trend is a declining yield. As our moisture increases, we start seeing our yields decrease. Now, there tends to be less of a relationship with the first 30 days of moisture, uh, kind of with this trend line being not so steep, uh, but you can see how steep of an angle this trend line is uh, with our total moisture through the entire growing season. I can tell you that the more moisture we receive through the entire growing season, your yields will start to decline. And that, and that point, uh, the tipping point, is going to be roughly that 20 to 25 pound, uh, inches of moisture. Uh, this is a slide that indicates the specifications that you all need to meet as a grower. Uh, this crop is intended for food grade. These are the only parameters that we are testing for to determine whether it's food grade or not. There is very, very little processing that happens with grain, uh, hemp grain, to be turned into a raw product uh, in, on the food supermarket store. Uh, we have two products essentially. We have our dehulled hemp hearts, uh, and we also have uh, the seeds that are being crushed for oil. Um, in both cases, there's just there is no way to control the microbes, uh, whether that be heat or some type of scrubbing process. That's not happening when this process happens. So we have a very strict uh, uh, standard here that has to be met because we're almost sending raw product to the, the supermarket. And this was a problem last year. We saw a lot of mold happening out in the field because of the white mold due to the increase in wet weather. Um, there were a lot of farmers who did not meet this specification. And unfortunately, they were rejected because of that. Um, just quickly here, uh, we can harvest the fiber from a grain crop as well once it's been combined. We're typically going to see in that one to three tons per acre. Um, most often what I hear from farmers who are harvesting their fiber after the combines roll through is it's easier to deal with in the spring than trying to cut and bale it after harvest. Uh, that overwintering process tends to loosen those fibers and makes it a lot easier. It's almost impossible, in fact, to, uh, to manage the stalks after the, the combines roll through. And it turns into something more like corn stalks, in a way, uh, by the spring. So it's a lot easier to manage in the spring than it is in the fall. Um, 
Keep in mind our, our disc mowers, uh, this crop has already been cut. Some of the fibers are already frayed. Uh, our disc mowers will want to start wrapping that fiber around the, the shafts uh, or, or bearings of your disc mowers and can easily start blowing gearboxes. This is the strongest uh, natural fiber on the planet. Uh, and even your disc mowers will not be breaking it. Uh, they, they will blow gearboxes. So keep that in mind. Um, large square balers is preferred with this method, again. Uh, so just to, just to wrap this up, field selection is going to be the most important thing that you need to look at of uh, determining where you plant this crop. We need to put, put this crop in an, in an environment that is going to have the highest likelihood of success. Uh, it's going to be a crop that's new to all of you, and it should be put on your soils that you feel comfortable with, a crop that you don't know much about. Uh, that is going to increase the success rate that you all have. Um, organics, uh, the best place to put this is following alfalfa. Uh, there, there really is no other spot uh, besides alfalfa that, that will outcompete uh, what we'll see organically following alfalfa. Uh, we want to think of ways that promote good seedling growth uh, and, and rapid seedling growth. So having a, a good seedbed preparation, having good fertility, uh, drier conditions than wetter conditions are, are best. We want to harvest just the grain heads rather than bringing all that fiber in the machine to avoid the, the wrapping of the shafts and bearings. Um, we should be considering cleaning that grain before it goes into the grain bin to get on the air. And then lastly, uh, the grain needs to enter that grain bin within that four to six hour window uh, so it does not start to spoil and potentially be rejected at the, the processor. Uh, so I, I just put this up here as a list of resources. Uh, this may be something you guys want to take pictures of or just write down. These are really, really good resources to find a lot of good information out there. Uh, with the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance, uh, Canadians have been growing this crop for 20 years and they've been taking all their data and putting it into this type of uh, online guide that they have. So I suggest, uh, you know, for those of you that want to learn more, uh, check out uh, the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance. Uh, with that, I guess uh, I'll end it there and, and we'll have time for Steve here.